Good morning and welcome to the Linus Rare Earths Investor Briefing for the March 2021 quarter. Today's briefing will be presented by CEO and Managing Director Amanda Lacaz. And joining Amanda for the briefing are CFO Gardin Sturzenegger, General Counsel and Company Secretary Sarah Leonard, and VP Strategy and Investor Relations Daniel Havas. I'll now hand over to Amanda. Please go ahead, Amanda. Thanks, Jen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you to all those who have joined the call today. Um, it seems just like yesterday that I was talking to you with the uh, half-year results. The, the, the sort of quarterly reports do do bring um, uh, us all together on a on a well a regular and frequent basis every quarter. Um, we're delighted, of course, to present another excellent quarter. Um, our production was in line with uh, our planning. Uh, as I've identified in the quarterly report, we've opted to keep production at 75% of Linus Next rates. Um, we continue to have challenges both with inbound and outbound logistics and um, you know, until we're able to build a significant store of uh, a concentrate ahead of the uh, plant in Malaysia, um, it's not our intention to dial up production significantly. Um, we keep putting concentrate on the water, um, but it keeps having sort of variable delivery dates. Uh, I'm pleased that our costs are in line with plan and uh, remain very much under control um, as we're operating at the 75% level. Of course, the market remains very buoyant and we're delighted with that. Uh, NDPR pricing is strong. Uh, pricing for heavies is also very strong. Um, and demand uh, also is very strong with many of our customers um, not only back to pre-COVID levels, but some of them, in fact, looking to uh, further growth uh, in the short term. Like many other firms, we were frustrated that um, a ship got stuck in the Suez Canal. And so as we look at our results, you know, we were well and truly on track for a absolute record quarter, but there was... Oh, couple of hundred tonnes, frankly, that didn't make it um, before the end of March as a result of delays in shipping. But uh, that material has left our plant in early April. Um, we, we, I guess where I'd like to, I mean, you know, some of the business as usual is pretty clear from our, um, uh, from the report. Uh, and just, you know, sort of a moment thinking about in this strong market, how do we make sure that we um, meet our objective of growing with the market? So as demand grows, how can we ensure that our capacity grows? And of course, that's associated with some of our key projects. And uh, keen readers will note that certainly um, the expectation from Chinese producers is that the market will continue to strengthen with some quite significant announcements regarding capacity uplift. So our key projects, which are going to allow us to grow with the market, include, of course, the Kalgoorlie project and um, the work on the development of our US uh, rare earth processing facility. So Kalgoorlie first. Um, Kalgoorlie is, uh, work is continuing apace. The project team um, is growing as is, uh, would be expected at this stage of the project. And we now have you know, um, most of the key positions with respect to managing that project um, within Linus are, are, are now filled. And uh, you know, we are making really good progress on um, uh, letting the you know, tendering and, and letting the contracts for a variety of uh, different pieces, you know, elements, equipment, uh, engineering, and and other works. Um, we've included some photos in here so you can see how far progressed um, the the um, uh, fabrication of the kiln is, which is of course very exciting. But as well as that, um, 
as part of the approval process, uh, the EPA has given us you know, limited uh, approval for limited uh, preliminary works on site. And it's important to note that these are you know, works which will ensure that when uh, we start receiving the equipment, providing we have the final approval, we will be able to move um, quickly. Uh, but they are not works which presuppose a, a ministerial decision. So the, the, the relevant act provides provision for minor or preliminary works that are associated with an in implementation of a proposal but are unlikely to have a significant environmental impact. And that's exactly what we're doing at present. Um, but it is very exciting to actually have people on site um, doing, doing those works. We've started to see a, a, a slight ramp up of, of um, capital associated with the Kalgoorlie project with a further step up expected in this quarter. Um, ahead of, as we've uh, indicated previously, the large capital spend, which we expect will be primarily in uh, the FY22, uh, in, in financial year 22. Of course, the other exciting news during the quarter, which we did cover when we did the um, uh, annual results, is uh, the uh, agreement from the DOD for a uh, contract to um, partly fund the development of a light rarers facility, which we would, um, which we we propose to have um, operating alongside our already planned heavy rare earths and um, and specialty facilities. This effectively means that our 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 um, uh, facility in the US is really a very substantial uh, facility with light separation, heavy separation and specialties all on the one site. Um, we think it's very exciting and really provides the fundamental um, you know, sort of foundation for the development, the further development of the rare earth uh, ecosystem um, in, uh, in, in the US. So we really think about it as a platform uh, for development of further activities in line with government policy. And of course, we've all seen that uh, governments continue to be very focused on the rare earth sector. Um, and of course, as we think about this, it's for reasons which are strategic. Um, of course, you know, geopolitics are an important part of that and uh, ensuring that there are resilient supply chains in all uh, key um, supply chain areas, but particularly for critical uh, materials um, is, is you know, at, at the forefront of government thinking. Um, the second area is, of course, that these are materials which underpin new technologies and um, you know, modern manufacturing capabilities. And so uh, governments all around the world are keen to ensure that they are part of the um, you know, significant development that we expect to see over the next couple of decades as we adopt new technologies, which are going to be, uh, frankly, better for us, um, our planet, but also better for consumers. And of course, the third reason my governments remain very focused on uh, this sector is that it is a critical part of economic recovery. And uh, as we see the continuing demand in key sectors for our materials, we see this as being a, a, a very positive thing for our industry and also for all of the industries which we feed. So, um, as I said, I, mean, I, I don't have a lot more to say other than the quarterly report speaks for itself. Again, um, a very good quarter. Um, we continue to see very positive and buoyant market conditions and are looking forward to finishing the year in very good shape. So with those as introductory comments, I'm very happy to take any questions that people might have. Our first telephone question comes from Jack Gabb from BOFA. Please ask your question, Jack. 
Thanks, and uh, morning, Amanda. I hope you're well. Um, just a couple from me. Firstly, just on the, I guess, the, the disparity between production and sales, you, you mentioned a couple of hundred tonnes were caught up um, around the Suez, but obviously the, the, the difference between uh, production and sales is a bit larger. So just curious whether you can make up the reduced shipping volumes this quarter, or are we going to see a, a further inventory build? Um, I'll start with that one. Thanks. Oh, hi, Jack. Um, the, all of that product's left the plant now. Um, I'm not going to tell you what our sales revenue in the first two months of uh, April is, but suffice to say, I have a very big smile on my face. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and then can you give us the latest on the permitting for the PDF? Have you completed the EIS? So the EIA um, has been... Uh, you know, we've been working very closely with all relevant authorities. Um, the EIA is largely complete. Um, documentation was lodged quite some time ago and it's been out for uh, public comment. We've taken on uh, and, and engagement. So we've taken on uh, comments which are relevant. I mean, there are a few which have come online which are not particularly relevant, like what effect it might have on the stray dogs in the area. But uh, um, we've certainly taken on all of the informed technical information to improve the EIA and undertaken significant engagement with local communities so that they understand really the effect of the EIA, the safety um, conditions associated with the project and have been very pleased with the support that we've received from those local communities. Um, it, within the next few weeks, the EIA will be finalised with a DOE decision on it. Um, and I say all of that in the context of the fact that, as you're aware, you know, we already have um, uh, agreements and approvals from a, a variety of other um, authorities and, and, in fact, the head authority, which is the AELB, um, which has, you know, identified that this is an appropriate site. Perfect, thank you. And then just one last one. Um, you mentioned uh, getting final approval for cracking and leaching. I'm just curious when you expect that? Oh, I never, ever, ever uh, um, suppose when any regulatory authority or government may make a, uh, a, a decision. Um, once again, uh, pleased to be able to advise that we have lodged the relevant documentation um, and we have been really uh, delighted with the speed with which, um, you know, assessments have been made. But, um, you know, the, the regulators have a task. They need to do it diligently. So it will take the time that it takes. And our focus is always on ensuring that they have the best possible information. Where we do that, then, you know, approvals can be turned around fairly quickly. Where we don't do that, of course, they take a little bit longer. Um, but uh, the, the um, documentation is, has been lodged with the regulators and so, you know, we will certainly advise um, when, when we get relevant decisions. Perfect. That's really helpful, Amanda. Thanks very much. I'll uh, pass it on. Our next telephone question is from Dylan Kelly from OID Minute. Please ask your question, Dylan. Yes, good morning, Amanda. Um, two quick ones from me. Just firstly, um, I'm, I'm curious as to the WA permitting, uh, the mention of a second project area for, for residue storage. Obviously, that raises a couple of eyebrows in terms of what's going on now. Um, could you just walk us through um, the requirements for, this, for the second area for, for waste disposal? And, you know, does that throw us better in the works or is this just steady as she goes? Yeah, okay. Um, you may have missed that earlier. Um, so we, we have actually advised that we have two sites in Kalgoorlie. Um, so Lot 500, which will be the primary site for the processing facility, and a lot at Yarry Road, which will be used over the life of the processing facility for uh, storage of byproducts produced at the facility. And this is simply reflecting the fact that um, you know, over the life of the facility, the lot 500 will not be sufficient for uh, storage of all of that uh, byproduct material. 
um, it has been a core part. It was uh, uh, in our initial discussions with the West Australian Mines um, Authority, um, you know, in line with their policy position that um, any project should have not only its operating parameters but also its closure plans in place um, right from the beginning is the reason why Yarry Road has been included. Uh, but it's not a change. Okay, understood. Um, just in regards to, to CapEx and, and project spend, um, what, $10 million for the quarter, um, I thought we were going to, I thought we were getting to the pointy end of you know, pre construction pre-works and paying for a lot of the, uh, the obvious progress that you've made with procurement of key pieces of kit. Um, when should we start be uh, expecting a large licks of capital start, um, start being paid for all the various project works that we've got going on? Well, I think $10 million is quite a lot more than we have as a normal uh, CapEx profile. True. Um, <laughs> so, so we are starting to see it now, Dylan. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of that $10 million is actually associated with the uh, 2025 project. Um, we expect that that will uh, step up you know, um, probably by about double this quarter and it will continue to increase as we move into FY22. Okay, great. Thanks, Amanda. We're not in a rush to spend the money and if we can agree payment terms, let's see work um, commencing um, and, and relevant payment terms, then, you know, there's no reason why we should uh, be spending all of our cash up front. Good to hear. Our next telephone question is from David Deckelbaum from Cohen. Please ask your question, David. Good morning, Amanda. Thanks for the time this morning. Morning, David. I was curious. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, get some clarification. You mentioned, obviously, in the release that uh, you see some of your competitors, namely in China, ramping up capacity, uh, yeah, presumably to meet demand. Um, how, how do you reconcile that with, with how you feel about the market right now and pricing and and what you're seeing on, on the demand side? Certainly you're seeing recoveries here, but uh, do you see a situation where the overall market is still going to have a difficult time keeping pace with demand? Um. So, uh, look, demand is strong, particularly for the magnetic materials. Although, interestingly, in immediately, you know, sort of post-COVID in the first quarter, uh, you know, sort of about this time last year, actually, in sort of March through to June, um, we saw a complete not quite collapse, but, but really substantive pulling back in the catalyst sector, um, particularly, of course, in, in fuel catalytic cracking because, you know, planes weren't flying and cars weren't driving and all of those sorts of things during those lockdowns. We've seen that recovery come really back. Um, this quarter was probably the first that we've really seen a, a real recovery in that area. And uh, similarly, in some of the um, auto cat sector, we've seen it not quite back to w where it was, but certainly it's recovered uh, somewhat from from you know sort of the the really substantive reduction last year. Magnetic materials through the the sort of the COVID challenges have held you know, sort of their own in terms of demand and, of course, as we're aware, uh, prices strengthened during that period. And um, we think that the fundamental trends, um, which the continuing um, growth in the key sectors, remain very favourably poised. And so we're looking forward to a very good, um, you know, sort of few years ahead of us. But as I've said, you know, one of the reasons why we're investing in additional capacity is that um, we've always articulated our strategy that we will grow with the market and we will maintain our share 
in the highest value seg segments, which is where where we uh, write most of our business. And so um, we really are focused on giving ourselves that ability to be able to ramp up as market demand continues. Um, I think that as we look at some of the you know, largest players in China, of course, um, it's uh, you know, their ability to leverage um, is, is quite strong. Um, and uh, so I'm not surprised that they're looking at being able to increase their production in exactly the same way as we are to, to, to ensure that we can meet demand. But um, we see the market settings very, sitting very favourably at present and, and would expect that that will continue in the foreseeable future. I appreciate that. Um, if I could just ask one more, just on uh, the U.S. expansion, uh, I think you mentioned that you'd have a, uh, a proposal, a design proposal on the heavy separation facility by June. Um, can you refresh us on the timeline for, for how you're thinking of uh, you know, submitting uh, proposals around the light separations facility, and would you look to begin construction concurrently on both projects, or would you would you sort of do the heavies and, and the lights in queue? Yeah, it's a good question, David. I mean, it, and, and as I said, the, uh, the, the fact that both of these um, uh, contracts are, or, or both of these initiatives are now being considered by the US government as areas worthy of um, support, uh, it, you know, it certainly upsizes the the facility that we're um, considering in, in, in the US. Um, and we certainly are not looking at them as two separate um, uh, projects. I mean, you know, ultimately we're talking about creating a platform for rare earths in the US. And so we need to be thinking about both of, both of these projects uh, concurrently, we need to understand, therefore, infrastructure and, and other capabilities which are necessary to support a facility of the size that this is going to be. With respect to the heavies, we have, you know, basically completed our homework on design and engineering and, and, and we'll be submitting that for consideration um, with the DOD in, in, in the near term. Um, with the lights, we still have uh, additional engineering work to do on that and some of this other work with respect to really what does this now whole facility look like as opposed to just sort of the separate production units. Um, we will keep people up to speed on it, but it is you know, clearly a conversation which we need to have with the USG and, and we're doing that on an ongoing basis. Thanks for that, Amanda. Our next telephone question is from Reg Spencer from Canaccord. Please ask your question, Reg. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Amanda and team. Uh, just as, uh, shifting back to, to Kalgoorlie, uh, outside of the, the permitting, which, which you ran through a little bit earlier, uh, are there any other impediments or risks uh, that may impact your construction timeline there? Uh, you, you, know, you, you mentioned that uh, you are experiencing some challenges uh, on, on the shipping uh, international logistics and I fully appreciate that there are quite a large element of the, your construction and manufacturing of that facility that, that will be happening domestically but um, you know, is there anything there that, that might present as a risk to achieving commissioning of Kalgoorlie in, in late 2022? Oh Reg, this is a big project you know, it's a $500 million project and we have a comprehensive risk register um, associated with this project, otherwise we wouldn't be running the project well. And we also have uh, a comprehensive um, list of mitigants uh, associated with those risks. But there are many risks associated with the project. At this time, um, our assessment of the risks and the mitigating strategies that we've been able to put in place tell us that we have no red lights. So um, I understand your point around the inbound logistics. 
Um, and we are very alert to that. Of course, there are some slightly different challenges when we're talking about a single shipment of a large piece of equipment compared to what we're talking about with needing to find you know, ships every week or every couple of days, either in or out of um, Malaysia. Um, so, you know, we, it's, it's not one of the, the risks that we've got as sort of a high risk at, at present. But, of course, there are many risks associated with Kalgoorlie, but our, our project team's task is to ensure we've identified them and put in place mitigating strategies, and we've done that. Okay, understood. One last question attached to Kalgoorlie. Um, as you progress through detailed design and, and commence construction works, are, are you seeing any material cost inflation, things like steel? Uh, you know, I think most people would be well aware of, of labour constraints in, in Western Australia. Um, uh, not that, that that's going to present a risk to your liquidity, but, but are you seeing uh, any cost inflation there over and above what your original estimates on the CapEx uh, might have been? Uh, no, not at this time. Um, we've got uh, actually we the, the the team has done an excellent work around specification and and tendering uh, for major equipment. Um, the project director keeps on telling me he won't give me back any of the contingency quite yet, um, but we haven't had to dip into the contingency for any um, elements. So we are largely um, placing our, our purchase orders in line with uh, our, our, our original um, expectations. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, Amanda. I'll uh, pass it on. Thanks, Rich. Our next telephone question is from Michael Evans from Ecova Capital. Please ask your question, Michael. Oh, good, good morning, Amanda. Thanks very much. David actually asked most of my questions, but just on um, China North, Rare Earth increasing their production, so doubling it over the next three years. I wasn't aware of that. Can you sort of elaborate on, on what you know about that and um, and maybe also remind us how much they produce? Well, I thought they produced uh, like close to 50% of the world's NDPR oxide or something like that. Maybe you, you, you'd have a better figure than me. Um, and have sure. they given any sort of colour on whether that's going into whether they're you know, increasing their sort of rare earth magnet production by that uh, by that magnitude as well. What what do you know about that announcement? Oh, uh, I don't know a lot more than, you know, I've already told you, Michael. <laughs> they said, you know, I mean these things as we all know can sometimes be a little opaque. Um but the first thing to say is China uh, is northern rare earths is about 60% of uh, China's production. So it is a very substantial step up, which is the reason why we've um, uh, flagged it in the report. Um, and Batu, which is in uh, in Mongolia, um, is a, a, a whole jurisdiction that takes a great deal of pride in its being you know, the centre of the rare earth uh, universe. I would love it if we could get to that same sort of position with um, some of our, um, our locations. And uh, over the years has, has really established substantive capability at all stages of the value chain, right through to the production of uh, electric motors. Um, today, so the you know, increasing um, production output in this area is a significant indicator of their expectation that the market will continue to grow and will continue to flourish. Um, so, yeah, it's a big step up, um, and uh, we see it as a very sort of positive sign in terms of confidence in the market. Fantastic. And, and maybe just one more on the market uh, conscious um, polls on the call. But with regards to your Japanese uh, customers, um, can you give us any colour or insight on what their magnet production is, is growth has been over the sort of last three to six months relative to sort of China's magnet production or global magnet production? Are they 
still sort of full steam ahead or or anything you can give us there would be great. Um, so, look, I don't know the relative number there, Michael. Um, you know, Japan versus China in terms of um, growth. What I do know is that uh, our demand from our Chinese customers has more than recovered sorry, from our Japanese customers, is more than recovered pre-COVID levels. And, um, you know, as we're looking to uh, future, um, you know, tautology, future forecasts, as we're looking at our forecasts, um, that that growth is expected to uh, further, to, to continue further. So our experience in the market is that the Japanese market is, is very buoyant and uh, you know that's a very positive thing for our business but whether that sort of uh, recovery and growth is at the same or higher or lower um, sort of velocity than what's happening in China I, I don't have that information to hand but I'm sure that um, you know separately you know we can we can have a look at that. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Amanda. That's all for me. Thanks. Our next phone question is from Matthew Chen from Foster Stockbrokers. Please ask your question, Matthew. Good morning, Amanda. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I just wanted to um, uh, drill a bit further down on that Northern Rare aspect of the, the announcement. So. Um, I just wanted to check if that production capacity, do you understand that to be um, the mining rate or the, the separation and smelting capacity, which um, maybe I misunderstood, but uh, I always thought the separation and smelting capacity wasn't an issue. It was, um, it was essentially limited by the quotas, which have, I, I understand have been um, growing quickly over the last couple of years. Um, and so, do you understand it to be in step with um, a, a list in quotas? Has that been kind of flagged um, by central authorities? Um, oh, look, you know, the China China market is the Chinese market is um, yeah quite complex, and mm. uh, you know, as I think everybody knows, relatively opaque. Um, we don't have a bunch of helpful uh, jolt code state, you know, res no. resource reserve statements and all of those sorts of things. Yeah. What we do know is that um, Northern Rare Earth has um, a very long life supply of rare yeah. earth um, yeah. as a consequence of, you know, the the material is being as a byproduct from their iron ore um, mining operations. Um, we also know that there's uh, over time been plenty of, you know, sort of separation capacity mm. in China. But I go back to, you know, sort of Northern Rare Earths and the, the investment and capability that they have in terms of their whole of rare earth business and so yep. um, it's you know as we think about their, their increase in capacity it's it's ensuring that you know these facilities are operating well and efficiently you know they right. remain we would say the only ones who are um, you know lower cost than us but they are lower cost than us yeah. and that's not just a volume effect it is you know sort of the quality of their operations as yep. well and you know so we we as you know are very focused on what can we do to you know make yeah. a further step down in terms of our costs so I, I can't tell you exactly how it factors mm. into any existing facilities that they <clears> might have I'm just, you know, we're just sort of flagging what has been, you know, sort of sure. a, announced. And as I said, you know, we see it primarily as a positive thing and a large uh, and professional and, and, and really, you know, sort of focused um, organisation like Northern Rare Earths, which will take a very professional approach to, to this sort of growth, I think is generally a good thing for the market. 
Yes. And, and like you said, I think you already that um, it 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 shows it shows quite sort of strong faith in the in in the demand side of the market because I mean I note that um, production quotas have already increased sort of fifty percent over the last three years, and you know if they run rate the second second half quotas with the same as the first half, they'll be on eighty something thousand tons of um, uh, rare earth production or lights for the year, won't they? So. Um, to double that again in um, three years, um, I just I just think that there's potentially uh, my sorry my understanding is essentially that it was always limited by um, um, central authorities rather than any limits to um, the resource or their capacity. So certainly there is that element to it, and you know um, sometimes the increase in quotas is more about um, you know, in quotation marks, legalising production, mm. which is all yes. already occurring. Um, so our our indications, and bearing in mind we've not had anybody been able to visit China for nearly two years now. Sure. Um, so, you know, we're working on sort of... Um, um, yeah, advice coming down the line, but um, mm. our, our indications are that the market market demand is very buoyant in the Chinese magnet yeah. sector. And just on that, um, are you? I mean, have you sort of filtered, sort of heard anything filter through about um, you know the situation in Myanmar and and shadow and legal production, um, uh, or particularly kind of mining? Um, from from that market, I have supply. no direct knowledge of any of, of any impact from um, Myanmar. Um, uh, logic says that there must be, mm. but I have no direct knowledge. Okay, um, and, and just a final one on um, the the reference to the judicial review application. Um, just remind me, this is um, this is a review as to the process of the um, 2019 renewal, um, but it's judicial review, so essentially um, that that original decision, you know, that kind of ministerial decision can't change. Is that is that um, that's the nuts and bolts of it? There's that well, judicial okay. review application in May, um, but that's it. Uh, I recall um, having a conversation with Andrew about this. Yes, it's a it's a, it's a strange um, uh, case. It it relates to uh, license, not our current operating license, but the operating license prior to that. Yes. So you know, I mean, it's uh, I I think that that from the legal documentation that we've seen that the government's position is consistent with ours and uh, right. essentially that, you know, it's it's not relevant because the subsequent um, renewal of the licence has been made. Yep. Okay. Thanks. I'll pass it on. Thanks. And we have a question from Tom Sumatsu from Bluebird Asset. Please ask your question, Tom. Hi, good, good morning, Amanda. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, you may have covered this earlier on, Mabs. I was just wondering, what's stopping Linus from ramping up to 100% capacity on Linus Snacks in Malaysia? Oh, um, really, it's primarily associated with some of the challenges that we have around logistics at present, um, and particularly related to getting concentrate shipments um, from, from Mount Wells across to Malaysia on a, uh, a a predictable basis, so you know we normally like to carry between about 15 and 20 days uh, stock in front of the um, plant, and uh, we've found it very difficult to sustain that. At one stage, um, I think at its worst, we had something like 32 shipments on on on, uh, on the water. Um, which had been rescheduled up to six to eight times each. Um, so it, it's just, and this is just a direct consequence of some of the issues associated with COVID, um, congestion in the Singapore port, etc. And so primarily 
that you know, the, the concentrate issue sort of guides us, but of course it's also related to other inputs. And so we've um, sought to increase inventory on, on shore so that we can continue to operate at our target levels. But, um, but what we don't want to do is to ramp up production and then find ourselves needing to you know, shut the plant down um, because we don't have, you know, sort of inputs, um, because, you know, the plant is running well and in very stable operation and uh, yeah. it doesn't like being, like any chemical plant, it doesn't like being turned on and off. So, so really, um, you know, we continue to really focus on doing this and um, we've put a lot of stock on the water um, uh, to to try to really sort of build build that stock, but you know we are finding um, just ongoing challenges with getting you know we're not we're not like you know sort of the big iron ore miners with our own you know sort of charters. We we need to find space on ships for for um, containers, and um, yeah, it just continues to be a bit of a challenge. Okay, so this is not relating to any permitting restrictions or limitations as to uh, production throughput? No, no. No, no. Okay. No, no. It's, okay. A, it's so quite, a, quite, quite a deliberate decision. And, and, and it's also associated with some of our health and safety protocols that we have in place. As you know, many people would know, you know Malaysia is in, in still experiencing a third wave of COVID. And uh, so, you know, we, we are uh, complying with all um, requirements to, you know, sort of be careful with, you know, how many staff we have on site and how we're managing them and all of those sorts of things. So the 75% level allows us to um, manage our business with some headroom for um, dealing with uh, unexpected you know, sort of um, uh, disruptions that might occur in all of these different areas. Okay. And and final one. So, I mean, the pricing environment is relatively favorable. And, you know, I mean, do you have any kind of, uh, it's a difficult question, but do you have any kind of uh, thoughts or guidance in terms of when we can get to 100% of next production capacity? Uh, I can tell you that there are many of us in the business that would very much like that to be tomorrow, but it is a balance. Um, and, you know, I'm sitting looking at our forecast on inventory um, and, uh, you know, sort of some of these other areas. And, and as I said, you know, even even with some of our inputs, you know, who would believe that a ship could block the Suez Canal and so some of the inputs that come from the Middle East and Europe for our plant, you know, of course have been delayed. So um, we review this on a weekly basis and I can assure you that given the strength of price and demand at present at the minute that we think that we can do this in a sensible way, we will be doing it. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks, Tom. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks all for joining today. Um, as I said, I think it's a, a, you know, we've, we've delivered an excellent quarter. Um, we certainly are managing to uh, deliver exactly what I think many of our shareholders who were with us, you know, have been with us for, you know, the past, sort of four or five years, I remember t saying in about 2017 that we were um, leveraged, that we were positioned to take full advantage of any upside in price. Um, I think that we're seeing the benefits of that today and uh, look forward to speaking with you again in another three months um, when we look at our full year um, outcomes. Thanks all. Bye.